What's with the sea lions? Uh, so we, we're on the banks of the Sacramento River. We're in Sacramento. And we're watching a California sea lion absolutely thrash salmon. We're about, I don't know, over 100 miles from the Pacific Ocean. And they're following the salmon up. They're following the Fall Chinook salmon run right now. So Joe, what we got here is... Welcome back to Where the Wild Roam. Today, we're in our home watershed, the Yuba River, and we're looking for spawning Chinook salmon. Chinook salmon are California's most prevalent salmon species. Let's review the journey and life cycle of salmon in California and all over the West Coast. Chinook salmon spend most of their mature life, adult life, out in the ocean. They're dodging killer whales, they're eating small fish and crustaceans, dodging some sharks. When it's time to spawn, they head for fresh water, first passing through the Golden Gate, then into the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta, the great estuary of California. This movement from salt water to fresh water is called the run. It's the time of year they leave to go spawn. After they pass through the Delta, they then enter the Sacramento-San Joaquin River system, heading north of the Sacramento or south down the San Joaquin. And what they're doing is they're looking for the river or stream tributary of their birth. It's called their natal river or stream. How exactly they locate their natal river is a bit of a mystery, but it probably has to do with how they use the Earth's magnetic field. And they can also smell it. They can smell that river. Oh, smells like home. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it will be a harrowing journey, and once they enter the fresh water, it gets even more difficult. You have these large fish species suddenly in shallow water. It makes them very vulnerable to predators, birds of prey, even sea lions. He was really thrashing that thing around. He's probably eating his fill, and he's just bored at this point. Uh, true story. I used to be a park ranger assistant right here in Discovery Park, I don't know, 12 years ago. And we would get phone calls this time of year when the sea lions would come up. And uh, I used to work dispatch and get the phone call and there's a, there's a monster in the river. And can you imagine if you had no expectation of a sea lion, 700 pound sea lion just throwing salmon and we'd get these panic calls like, there's something eating all the salmon. So now the salmon have made it back to their natal river and the spawn begins. The first thing they do is they find a suitable location, a gravel bed. Next, the female will dig what's called a red. It's essentially a nest, like a little basin in the gravel bed. And she will dig it with her tail. You can actually spot these reds. They'll be scrubbed clean of algae. Kyle got some great overhead shots of a red here. This is on Butte Creek that you're gonna learn all about in a few upcoming episodes. Here we see a female salmon called a hen. And she is excavating her red right here, doing some work. Super cool. Uh, so she's gonna dig this little red, lay her eggs, and then one or more male will come up, do a little shimmy, and he will fertilize the eggs. The female will then recover the eggs with gravel, and she will sit and defend it. Nice cowboy hat. Thanks, man. Thanks, thanks partner. What are you doing? Get the GoPro ready to put it underwater and hopefully get some of these spring run Chinook. Did it work? Did it work? Oh yeah. This hen cruises up, checks our camera out. These are huge fish. Huge fish. You can see this little six or seven inch trout right here making its way beneath this hen. Look how big she is. Some more red excavation about to occur right there. This big male is going to come up. Do his little shimmy. 
Gross. To really get a sense of the magnitude of excavated reds spawning salmon can build, we took another aerial view right above where we were standing on the Yuba. That light colored patterning you see is actually a bunch of reds, like reds on reds. Given enough time, thousands of fish over thousands of years can completely turn over the bed of a river. And as you get in closer, you can see the individual fish. After the eggs are fertilized and the female defends them for a period of time, both her and the males, they all die. They've basically come back home to reproduce and die. And therein lies both the beauty and the tragedy of the salmon story. It really is a beautiful story, but it comes with a major catch. That whole journey from adult in the ocean to the upper watershed with their spawning habitat, to the eggs that need water temperature and conditions to hatch, for the little fish to make it all the way back to the ocean to turn into adults once again, that all requires complete ecosystems and quality habitat along the way. And that's why wild salmon in California are at a tipping point right now. That habitat has changed. Here in the Yuba River and almost every other tributary of the Sacramento-San Joaquin River system, the salmon don't have far to go, and that's because of dams. Now look, I'm not about to go off on dams. I have benefited from dams most of my life. But for salmon and a lot of other wildlife species, dams suck. Dams prevent how far upstream salmon can spawn. This map shows the present range of fall run Chinook salmon. This map shows the historic range of fall run Chinook salmon. Every time you see the habitat change and it's limited, that's because of a dam. With dams limiting historic spawning habitat, that has significantly reduced Chinook salmon numbers here in California. fish hatchery, the Feather River Fish Hatchery. It was constructed in like 1967 to mitigate the loss of upper watershed spawning habitat when Oroville Dam was constructed. The fish enter the hatchery through the Feather River and they kind of hit this barrier dam constructed to disallow fish passage. That's the barrier dam right there. Fish then have no choice but to come up this fish ladder and go into the hatchery itself. Look at the size of this fish! Look at that thing! Maybe like hold your arm out the length of it. Oh, huge! It's a big animal. Inside the hatchery, the fish are euthanized, the females are cut open, and the, the males are kind of bloated with air, and their milk is used to fertilize the eggs in kind of a factory laboratory type setting. It's not too late. Turn around. Go back to the river. You won't get to do your shimmy. That being said, this isn't any sort of fish trap. This hatchery's been in operation for 50 years. These fish were most likely reared inside the hatchery. Now, nothing against the hardworking people who operate and manage this facility here. They do a great job. But fish hatcheries are really designed to mitigate two things, the loss of salmon completely and the loss of the commercial fishing industry. They don't do much for wild salmon aesthetics, you know, the feeling of having wild salmon in our world. Uh, they also don't do much for wild salmon genetics. When those eggs and those juveniles are raised in that environment, we're kind of taking over nature's selection. Natural selection is not happening in this artificial environment. And of course, hatcheries do nothing, nothing at all. No mitigation, no compensation, nothing for the loss of salmon to the ancestral lands of native Californians. Each year, it's my guess, 
that the return of salmon to those ancestral watersheds and to those ancestral lands was a source of not just you know protein and food but a source of livelihood spiritual renewal cultural identity and that was all just taken away for example Shasta Dam was constructed in the 1940s and it forever restricted salmon access to the upper Sacramento watershed. That was a major, major impact to native Californians. And that wasn't an impact that occurred in 1940. That's an impact that is still occurring right now. Right now, the Wyndham and Wintu are advocating for the removal of Shasta Dam or some other means of restoring salmon you know, above Shasta Dam in the McLeod River and their ancestral lands. So now we've reviewed the salmon life cycle and current habitat loss due to dams and other factors. Now here's the exciting thing that we've just learned and we're super excited to share with you. There's actually four different races of Chinook salmon in California. It's the four different runs. The biggest run in the history of California and the most salmon numbers was not the fall run, it was the spring run. That is, salmon coming upstream in the watersheds during the spring. And even more exciting, we found that there's three locations in California where the spring run is still occurring. And we're gonna visit those locations. We're gonna meet with the people who are on the front line of conserving the last of the spring run salmon. And you're gonna see why spring run Chinook are the last wild California salmon. That's one professional camera. You guys on a crew or something? Yeah, we're making a little, little salmon documentary. Sweet. Yeah, you can barely find anything about this on YouTube, so. Yeah, exactly. So Where the Wild Realm is hosted by Joe Flannery. My grandfather was a park ranger. My parents were both park rangers. I was the third generation. I've been lucky enough to spend my entire life outdoors, learning and working in conservation. And I'm excited to share that knowledge with you. With Kyle Lancaster. Lately, we've been getting into conservation filmmaking. We believe that a conservation ethic begins with education and understanding. Never stop learning about the natural world. And hey, if you like the show, please support, share, subscribe, follow, like, and all that stuff. Let's start a movement that prioritizes wildlife, wild places, and conservation within our daily lives.